Hi guys and welcome back to Biolog. Hope you're having a great day and a great week. Today's video is going to be a topic wise question video again, a past paper series on the topic reproduction. So we're going to cover all the subtopics under the reproduction like advantages and disadvantages of asexual and sexual reproduction, fertility drugs, the menstrual cycle, the concentration of hormones, etc. So if you like this video, do like, share and subscribe to Biolog. With that being said, Let's just get right on to these questions because there are some really good questions that I have found for you guys to solve with me. So let's get on to this video. Hi guys. Alright, so I have compiled a few of the questions. Now let's go through them. So firstly, the figure 3.1 shows the changes in concentration of FSH and three other hormones in the blood during one menstrual cycle. Describe the changes in the concentration of FSH during one menstrual cycle. Alright, they are talking about FSH. So you need to talk about the graph that shows FSH. It is this graph. As I am pointing with the yellow color, it is this graph. Alright, so this is what you need to be paying attention to. So, initially you can see that till the second day or so, the concentration of FSH increases. But after the second day, the concentration starts to decrease. Then, exactly on the 14th day, the concentration of FSH peaks. And finally, you are able to see that there is a constant or very low value of FSH. Concentration is very low from almost the 18th to the 20th day. So, in this way, you are supposed to describe the trend in the graph. Alright, for each hormone, if they ask you for another hormone like estrogen or progesterone, you have to describe the trends in the graph, what you see and what you can infer from the graph. So, what will be the answer to this question? Firstly, yes, the concentration increases from day 0 to 2, as you can see right here. Concentration decreases till day 13. That is true. Till about this point, you can see that the concentration decreases. Alright? FSH concentration peaks on day 14. Yes, here this is known as a peak or maximum. It peaks at day 14, which is ovulation. Remember, ovulation occurs at day 14. Then, it decreases from day 14 to day 23. Day 14 to day 23. Mm -hmm. Right. It decreases from about day 14 to day uh, 23, which should be somewhat here. You could write and then after that it remains constant from this part also which will give you an AVP mark on an additional point uh, because it is giving some data from the graph. So if you have time and if you do uh, think that it's necessary, then you can write that point as well. Now, explain the role of FSH in the control of the menstrual cycle. Now, do you see the difference between these two terms? Describe and explain. Describe means you just have to take the terminology from the graph. You have to infer everything from the graph and then say what exactly what are the trends you see in the graph explain means you have to describe in terms of biology like biological terms is what you have to use to describe the phenomenon of describe the concept the biological concept is what you have to describe when they say uh, explain right so explain the role of FSH in the control of the menstrual cycle you have to explain in biological terms what is the role uh, of FSH in the uh, functioning and in the control of the menstrual cycle now the first point is that we know FSH or follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the growth and development of the follicle cells that is true it causes the release of estrogen right so remember estrogen Estrogen actually stimulates LH and inhibits FSH but when you have the menstrual cycle happening during the follicular phase the FSH increases and because of the increase of FSH estrogen also increases so an increase in FSH causes an increase in estrogen so if the FSH increases estrogen will also increase the last point is once estrogen is secreted 
FSH levels decrease. Yeah, exactly. So why does that happen? Because estrogen inhibits FSH, meaning it does not stimulate the FSH. It causes it to decrease. So once estrogen is secreted, the FSH levels concentration decreases to prevent the formula uh, formation or stimulation of further follicle cells or further eggs. All right. So these are your three points. Similarly, here are your three points as we covered or you could even write the fourth point as I mentioned, which is a constant right here. All right, moving to the next question. Figure 5.1 shows a fetus developing inside the uterus. We have the uh, structure labeled. The diagram is labeled already. Now let's look at the question. Describe how the structures named in the figure provide the following needs of the fetus protection all right so if you look at this you are able to see the main thing about protection is that you want to think about mechanical protection protection from mechanical injuries so when we think about protection from mechanical injuries we have to think about the amnion containing the amniotic fluid right amnion or the amniotic sac this is also known as amnion and this contains the amniotic fluid so the amniotic fluid, you can say it also acts as a shock absorber. Amniotic fluid acts as a shock absorber to provide protection against mechanical damage. It also provides protection against pathogens and keeps a sterile environment. That is important, a sterile or a clean environment for the growth and development of the fetus. Then you also have to talk about the placenta. Now, what is the placenta? It is this structure right here, which is the separation between the maternal blood and the fetal blood, the mother's blood and the fetal blood. So the placenta prevents the maternal and the fetal blood from mixing together. Prevents the maternal and the fetal blood from mixing. Right. Now, constant temperature. Now, the const in the constant temperature, you have to talk about uh, maintaining an optimum temperature for the growth and development of the fetus, right? So, you should talk about how the amnion or the amniotic sac helps to reduce heat loss. It also uh, helps in the blood flow. So, the blood flow is the one that uh, prevents the heat of other places from entering. So, it maintains a constant temperature. Constant temperature doesn't necessarily mean that it remains warm or it remains cold. It means that the temperature remains the same throughout the period of time. So it could be that either it prevents a loss of heat or it prevents the gain of heat. Right. So it helps reduce heat loss and the blood flow to the uterus where the embryo is implanted brings heat from elsewhere in the mother's body. And this also helps to maintain a constant temperature because you can't allow the fetus to get too cold. That could also be a source of mechanical damage. Now. Moving on to the next point, nutrients. So nutrients as in the vitamins, minerals, etc. All the essential biomolecules or food groups require for the baby or the fetus to have a balanced diet. Right. So the nutrients get transferred to the fetus by diffusion, which occurs from the maternal blood or the mother's blood to the fetal blood. All right. This is self-explanatory. Lastly, we have excretion of metabolic waste. The mother excretes the fetal uh, metabolic waste or nitrogenous wastes as well. So, urea and carbon dioxide diffuses across the placenta from the fetal blood into the maternal blood or the mother's blood. So, I, as I mentioned, the mother will excrete the urea, carbon dioxide or other nitrogenous wastes that are coming from the fetal blood. This is eight marks. So ensure that you have all these points covered to get those full marks. All right. Moving on to the next question. We have this question. Yes. In many countries, there are dangers in using milk powder because it cannot be prepared under sterile conditions. Explain the dangers of feeding non-sterile milk to children who may have HIV plus. Very important. So firstly, remember that when you're born, like when a baby is born, the immune system is generally very weak. Either they have no development of the immune system at all or their immune system has been developed to a certain extent where it is still very weak, right? So newborn babies have a weak immune system. So if they have HIV, HIV, what does HIV do? It reduces the number of lymphocytes, right? So it will infect their white blood cells or the lymphocytes to be specific. 
Secondly, so very few antibodies are produced, right? Because lymphocytes are the ones that produce antibodies. Then the milk may also have harmful microorganisms or pathogens, which can lead to waterborne diseases, right? Because most content of milk is water, right? It contains uh, water and some uh, additives. If it is the uh, store-bought milk, you will have additives of preservatives and milk powder, etc. But some of the content is water, so waterborne diseases can arise from it. For example, cholera can come from it. Uh, fourth one is that so if cholera does come from it then it will lead to diarrhea vomiting as well as dehydration because of the loss of uh, salts because cholera causes the it cholera produces a toxin that causes the secretion of chloride ions so it causes a loss of salts hence it causes diarrhea vomiting and dehydration all right moving on to the next question so even though there is a risk of uh, HIV infection, it is sometimes advised that women breastfeed their babies. Explain the advantages of breastfeeding. Okay, so uh, it is self-explanatory that there is a bond created between the mother and the baby, right? So the first point would be that there is a bond that is created between the mother and the fetus or the mother and the baby. And there are lesser risks of allergies, obviously, because it's directly coming from the mother. It's not store-bought. There are no additives. There are no preservatives, right? Third thing, it is at the correct temperature because it's coming from the mother's body. It will be at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. So it is at correct temperature for the fetus or the baby to consume. Fourth point is that it contains antibodies. Now, what is colostrum as uh, seen here? Colostrum is the yellow sticky liquid that comes out initially when the uh, baby starts to feed on the mother's milk, right? So it is uh, something that contains high amount of protein and antibodies. So it helps providing passive immunity to the baby. Passive immunity means where the antibodies are not uh, actively produced. They are not actively produced, but they are directly fed into or given to the uh, person inheriting or getting these antibodies. So they, they provide a source of passive immunity to the baby. All right, two ways in which an adult can become infected with HIV. There are lots of um, methods that you can actually write for this answer. You can even write uh, unprotected sexual intercourse or you can write uh, blood transfusion, sharing of needles or syringes, etc. But because these two points have been seen across most of the mark schemes when they talk about how a sexually transmitted disease can be transferred from one host to another, uh, you should probably make uh, general points like these, blood transfusion and the sharing of needles or syringes also you can write. All right. The next question talks about the placenta. The placenta is adapted for the exchange of substances between the maternal and the fetal blood. Describe the exchanges that occur across the placenta to keep the fetus alive and well. So oxygen diffuses from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. In this case, you have to write like what are the substances that move from one direction to another. So oxygen will diffuse from the maternal blood to the fetal blood. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the fetal blood to the maternal blood. The urea or the nitrogenous wastes like uh, urine, feces, etc. pass from the fetal blood to the maternal blood. And the antibodies like uh, antibodies or hormones even you can say. Hormones like uh, HCG, estrogen, progesterone uh, all pass from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. So, Alright, so these are the four important points that you should be writing. Now, moving on, uh, the placenta secretes hormones estrogen and progesterone. Describe the roles of these hormones during pregnancy. Estrogen is used to thicken the uterus lining. So, it's thickening the uterus lining or the endometrium. And progesterone is used to proliferate or maintain pregnancy, right? Maintain pregnancy. Estrogen inhibits the release of FSH and it stimulates LH. So, you can also add one more point here that estrogen stimulates LH so it inhibits FSH stimulates LH and because it inhibits FSH all right it prevents the development of many follicles in the ovary after ovulation prevents the formation or development of many follicles in the ovary after ovulation all right Moving on to the last question, 
outline two social implications of using fertility drugs right this is a pretty uncommon question so you should be knowing the answer to this as it's more likely that they will choose these kinds of questions over the ones that are very common in papers firstly religious objection or uh, religious objections or uh, ethical concerns right religious concerns so religious objections to the use of fertility drugs right it may lead to multiple births so because usually uh, just like things like ivf uh, fertility drugs also lead to multiple births so it is not usually considered to be a natural form of uh, conceiving natural form of pregnancy or a right? natural form of giving birth that is one of the reasons why it it is seen to be a social uh, problem sometimes so it may lead to multiple births and this is not the natural way of conceiving all right that is all for today's video guys if you like this video do like share and subscribe to biolog with that being said i will see you guys in my next video have a great day